I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. Kamal Salim was reared in an uh, Islamic home in Beirut, Lebanon. He will have much more to say about that. And his life story has now been published by Simon & Schuster in the book, The Blood of Lambs. And several, uh, I guess it was over a year ago or so, I actually read that book and was very captivated by the story of how this man, who was a radical Islamist terrorist, came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. And uh, it was through a friend, Don Ben Curler, we're so glad to have Carol with us this morning. It was through a friend, Don Ben Cur Curler, who has now gone home to be with the Lord, uh, that I was able to speak to Kamal over the telephone and arrange this special event where he would actually tell us from the inside, year after year, many of you even visitors are return visitors who come year after year for this particular Sunday, uh, year after year you have heard me give what is my studied appraisal of the religion of Islam. and I put a lot of effort toward that. Now you will hear for the first time ever someone who grew up in that system, who understands it from the inside, and who understood it from its most violent and hate-filled sector, that of being a former terrorist. And so Kamal Salim, if you will please come to our platform and give us the message the Lord has laid on your heart. Thank you so much. God bless you. Well, to God be the glory. Everybody say, to God be the glory. I was not going to open with this, but... Don Van Curler and his wife, they are not just people, you know, just like that you meet on a daily basis. They are moving, allowing the movement of Christ to take place throughout the land. Don and his wife are warriors. These people understood what the call is all about, and they took it to heart. If you, get the, if you knew Don you would have loved him because he oozed with Jesus Christ. And every time you see him, you just want to gobble him up. That's how beautiful he was. And thank God that his wife still is, is with us. And today, she take on the torch to carry on the glory of Jesus Christ in our time. 1683. 1683, the Ottoman Empire... Ahmed Basha, the Khalifa of the Ottoman Empire, raised 250,000 soldiers. These soldiers were not the regular soldiers. These guys knew how to fight. They were warriors. Their sword tasted the blood. The, the blade on, it, on the sword, it tasted thousands and thousands of human souls. And he went and marched over all the way to the gate of Vienna. Right there at the gates of Vienna, he besieged Vienna. Vienna was the center, the center of power, of education, of liberty, of freedom, of all things. Christianity was celebrated over there. Beyond the borders of Vienna stood freedom. People were dealing in businesses. All the, uh, the marketplaces between Europe and Middle East came through the gates. And Islam besieged Vienna, and they were going to go ahead and bring it to submission. Now, John II, king of Poland, came to know that he was, at that time, he was in charge, and he came to know that if he does not stand up for what is good, what is pure, and what is lovely, then the whole humanity and Christianity will vanish. This is where your call is today. America is a symbol of freedom. Freedom and liberty. Glory. Pursuit of happiness. Where we send people to help all over the world to reach the lost. Those who are blind, they see. Those who are hungry, they are fed. 99% of the world mission come from the United States of America. The whole world is watching the United States of America. The whole world is watching what Vienna is going to do. They put their tents over there. And they're going to sit there until Vienna comes to submission. John II raised 60,000 soldiers. These 60,000 soldiers 
He stood before them. He raised them from Germany, from Poland, from Vienna. And he said to them, he said, today we stand on the edge of time where humanity could change, history can be written, our world will never be the same, our children and grandchildren will be in submission and enslaved to a culture that does not know love and freedom. He stood there and he said, today our Christianity will never be the religion, the belief, the system that free people be allowed all over the world. He said, today we stand on the edge of time where we have to fight for our life. He said, fight for your king. Fight for Christ. Fight for God. Fight for your belief. Fight for your children. Fight for your grandchildren. The gates opened up that day. 60,000 soldiers with their long spears. They marched at 250,000 soldiers. And the spirit of the Lord was upon them. And they pierced the Ottoman Empire and pushed it all the way back to Syria and Lebanon. They were slaughtered. At that time, it was September 11, 1683. Everybody say September 11, 1683. September 11, 2001 did not happen just because it's a mere, it's just image or something like this. It is a date that they remembered one day lost to Christianity. Because Islam, if Islam is defeated... It could not retreat. Islam, you either die, you will not take retreat. That's why they could not stop building the Ground Zero Mosque. And everybody needs to know that they will move forward, despite whether you like it or not. This is why we have to stand for what we believe in and let our voices be known. My name is Kamal Salim. We have a ministry. It's called Qum. Qum is an Aramaic word for arise. Jesus Christ stood before Lazarus' graveyard, and he said, Lazarus, kum. And a new life was given to, to Lazarus, because he was dead, but now he can see. He's alive. He went to Thalithia's home, and Thalithia was dying. They said, don't bother, Rabbi. Who remembered that story of Thalithia? And he grabbed by the hand, and he said, she's not dead. She's asleep. And he grabbed, and he said, Thalithia, kumi. And a new life was given to her. Today, when God is calling us, He's sending us, He's arising us to power and glory, not to sit down, because as long as we're sitting, we're worshiping other God greater than Him, American Idol. Mm. Oh, Tahoe. Mm. A beautiful car. The God of, you know, as long as we're finding this, what happened is we are not exalting God, and God is not fighting for us. To take place and stand for God, for his glory and his honor, majesty is the first mandate. He said, go in my name. It is in the going when God celebrates his word. It is in the going where God gives you the victory. It is in the going, obedience take place, and now God is revealed. Our first, our first mission is to wake up the church and bring them, let them know that Jesus Christ loved them and he's missing them. To wake them up. Number two is to let them know we have a lot of work to do and to send them out there and let them know about the danger that they are facing Islamization of the whole world, not just America. It just arrived to America, 2001. But prior to that, it was invading the entire Europe, European continent and the whole world. The third one is to reach out for our Muslim brothers and sisters out there because it is for such people that Jesus Christ died too. They are also the seed of Abraham, not the promised one, but yet there are promised to Abraham and Hagar what God made the promise to her that he will bring them in. So our message is really not to hate the Muslim, it's to love the Muslim. I hate Islam. Why? Because Islam enslaved humanity. Who was here the first service? Okay, and then who was not here the first service? Okay, we can go now. Islam came to bring back humanity to slavery. And this is what we fight for. Before I go further, in our material here, there are informational for those who doesn't know what they are. Please ask out there, and we'll be glad to educate you about them. And I'll sign the book, too. Just like Pastor said, thank you for the Sheriff's Department and all those who are here protecting us and 
Don't stand up. God bless you for all that you do. We respect you and we appreciate you. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, to a Muslim Sunni family. In Beirut, my cousin today, he is the Grand Imam. He's the Grand Mufti, which is the Pope of Islam. He's the one who declares Sharia law. He's the one who declares what's the, the laws of Islam. Over there, I was born in that house, which is we didn't have a whole lot. We were very poor. You know, the, the way American people live now, even for a poor family, it's better than mid-class family in the East. The way we live here in the United States of America, it's greater than any, you know, we ever seen. We lived in a three-room house, a bedroom, living room, and a kitchen. In that house, we were 14 brothers and sisters. One mother. My favorite place in the house was the kitchen. That's the only place that gave and never asked back for anything. The rest, you have to shed blood. In all in all, my mother was my teacher, was my, the, the one who took me deeper and challenged me to go deeper. Right there in the kitchen table, we have a, what's so-called tabli. It's a small table like this. We sit on the ground and we eat on the floor. Girls on one side, the boys on the other side, mom on one side, dad on the other side. There I learned about who I'm going to be one day, how I'm going to change the world. My mother said to me, because if you have pure heart, one day you will die for God. One day you will shed your blood. She said, my son, if you kill a Jew, your hand will light up before the throne of Allah and the host of heaven will celebrate what you have done. I used to dream about killing Jewish people every day. I practice on every cat, every dog, on every insect. I used to think that they are Jews and they are a cat no more. The neighborhood used to have cats all over and they disappeared. This is my childhood. My, we didn't have a TV in our home. We didn't have Xbox. We didn't have SpongeBob SquarePants either. <laughs> we had over there the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran is the, the word given to Muhammad by Allah. My wife gives me a hard time about my Bible. She said, it's falling apart. You have a tape all over it. I said, I can't let go of it. It's marked everywhere. I just have my life, my walk in it everywhere, you know. Show me your Bible and I will tell you who you are. Let me look at your Bible. The Holy Quran we were learning from our childhood. By the time you reach 10 years old, you have to recite the Quran three times. The whole Quran from end to end. To the point that we know it by heart. And now I'm learning and I'm growing up. And then over there, my mother was teaching us about Futuhat al Islamiyah, the war, Islamic war. It was the biggest movie I've ever, ever seen. It was 3D in my mind. I was watching how we invading everything in love to bring about Islamization. You see, Islam is nothing like Christianity. Islam is by the sword, it's not by the word. There I was reciting the Quran, and as I was reciting the Quran, it says, in the surah, it's called the earthquake. It says, whatever you do, small or big, Allah will judge you based on this. You either go to heaven or to hell. And my dad came and he said, Allah will hold scale in his hand. And based on this, the choice is made. And my mom taught us that day, and she said, the Quran teaches us, that, that every Muslim would have to go to hell first, and after they go to hell and purify, then they can go to heaven. So I'm going like, so no matter how much I've done good, I have to go to hell? She said, yes. She said, accept the martyrs. And she said, my son, you are a martyr. One day you will die for the sake of Allah. I didn't know better, but whatever mom told me, she's my mom. She's the one who nursed me to life and gave me everything. Now my dad took over and he said, when a martyr die, the first thing a martyr does, the first drop of your blood as you die, you forgive 70 of your immediate family. Your mom, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, dad, grandfather, all of them in heaven because your blood set them free. You become like a messiah to them. What happened? You intercede for your family by your blood. That's why women Mothers sending their children said, go die for the sake of Allah because he is the way to them to go to heaven. 
The second drop of blood, my dad says, you get 72 versions. In Muslim heaven, there's only female versions, there's no male versions. When a Muslim dies, he gets 72, you know, as a martyr, he gets 72 versions, and with every version, he gets 72 versions. I'm listening to my dad, I'm going, wow, dad, this is great. You're having a problem with my mom, and she's only one. How are you going to control a herd of versions? And my dad looking at me like, well, the grace of Allah is sufficient. I'm going, all right, the grace of Allah is sufficient for them. It's for me too. So I'm now walking in that sufficiency. I made the second mistake, and I said to him, if my mom dad died as a martyr, will she get 72 male version? My first golf class. My dad was blacksmith, and his hand, he can rub the paint off the wall. It transformed me. I was raptured by his hand going right under my chin, hit me to the wall, hit the ground, make a first hole right under the bed, and he was about to kill me because this is defined Islam. You never question Islam in your life. You never bring things above the understanding of Islam. This is when I was five and six years old. Now I'm going to the mosque, I'm attending the mosque, and I'm praying down the street, and there's a group in the mosque called the Muslim Brotherhood. Everybody say the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is what they refer to them in the whole world is Ekka Ikhwan. Ikhwan means brothers. And the Muslim Brotherhood, they're the, the, uh, the, uh, the root of all evil. Why? Because they are the one all radical Islamists coming from like Isna, here in your state, five miles down the street from here. Isna is Muslim Brotherhood front shop. Care. C-A-R-E, you know, they, they really don't care. These people call, the, you know, their self that, you know, they are presenting Islam, what's so heavy? They are a Muslim Brotherhood front. Al-Muhajirun, Islamic American society, and all of them, one after the other, all of them are front end for Muslim Brotherhood. I was taught by the Muslim Brotherhood how to possess the West. We were taking classes as children, the day is going to come on our shift, we're going to take over your world. And we were being prepared as soldiers. I want to show you a movie. And that movie, it shows you some of my childhood. Go ahead and roll that, please. A couple of years ago, in my capacity as a filmmaker, some of the footage that you are about to see came into my hands. Try to look past it sometimes raw quality. It is blurry and shaky, but it is footage that has come directly off Arab TV and from the internet. Be warned that the content is at times shocking and bloody. The human behavior is unbelievable, violent and many times basically barbaric. Arab television daily presents hours of biased news reporting and airs children's shows and other programs relaying powerful political and religious messages to millions of Arabs in the Middle East, many of them children. But the teaching of violence and hatred doesn't stop in the Middle East. As I further investigated my information, I was shocked to learn that men, women and children in America are learning terrorist disciplines. By many years of cult research and exposure to the indoctrination and brainwashing by cult leaders to their followers, I have witnessed some horrible aspects of cruelty and brutal attempts at breaking the human spirit and mind. But never before have I seen an entire generation of young people being impacted at the magnitude of brainwashing by today's political and religious indoctrination the ramifications of which are a pending danger to us as a civilization. This may look like a children's community or school parade. While Westerners might use an event like this to promote wholesome values such as championing freedom and respect for the rights of individuals, in the Middle East these children are being prepared for something much more sobering. They are taught from birth that war isn't merely a video game or movie to be entertained by. 
but a personal involvement in their everyday lives. Many means are being used to condition these children to violence and hatred. The school classroom, television talk shows and dramas, animated cartoons, and these shocking assault course training camps. All these methods are vehicles to desensitize children to death and murder. Loading machine guns, handling ammunition, and a scene shooting guns is normalized. Children are not only being taught to kill others, but incredibly they are also being taught to die as suicide bombers. Here, an Arab reporter is asking a young Muslim boy why he wants to be a martyr. Friday is the Muslim day. What, like the Jews have Saturday, the Christian have Sunday, the Muslim have Friday. And what we do in our Muslim world over there, when we congregate many, many times, the majority of the time, the message is hate message. It's inflammatory and accusatory, and it's based on many things, phantoms that doesn't even exist. So therefore, what happened as we gather in unison all over the world of Islam, what happened is we sent hexes, vexes, curses, ill-spoken word against you, your children, your seeds, your finances, your government, your military, your weaponology, you're going out, you're coming in, your sleep, your health, all of it, we curse it every Friday. Every Friday we gather together, by the millions all over, 1.5 billion Muslim, when they go to the mosque, they curse their enemy. This is what I grew up with. My mother was teaching me on the kitchen table. She said, my son, there's two kind of sins. One is white sins and one is dark sins. The dark sins is when you lie about yourself. You say, I have a doctorate, PhD in uh, terrorism. You know, you're a liar. This is against you. But the second one, if you lie to advance Islam, then this is considered righteousness. It is permitted, so if you ask a Muslim many times, ask him about something, it's his full right, because you are not a Muslim, to lie to you, it's a mandate. This is in Islam, we call it Al-Taqiyya. Al-Taqiyya is a mandate that's given by Muhammad to his people. It was in the book, it's called Surah, and it's Ahzab, which is the parties, and when he went, when he rose from, Me from Medina, and he rose, went to Mecca to kill his family, his cousins, his uncles, his tribes, when he went over there to war against them, he sent one of his men, he said, go and spy on them. And the man said to him, well, if I go there, I have to lie about you. Don't you kill people like me who lies about you? He said, whatever you say for the sake of Allah and for my sake and for sake of Islam, it is completely forgiven. Are you listening to me? Are you hearing this? Today you are facing a UFO. You don't know how it tastes, what it's what it speak like, what's the understanding, what's the heart, what the you know, this is the word of God says my people perish for the lack of knowledge. And knowledge is you have to acquire it. You go and acquire knowledge. You know, unfortunately that there's no too many Quran that tell the truth, but we're writing a new Quran, it's coming soon. Hopefully we'll have this and we'll let Pastor know about it. And this will be a commentary Quran, which is will tell you the truth in the Quran, what it says. Right there as I was in the mosque being trained on all things, how to become Islamist. What happened is the whole group went and joined the PLO. At that time, the PLO called Fatah. And when we went to the camp for the first time, I was a little boy. I was seven years old. My first time went to the camp. And then when I went over there, these warriors came from all over the place. They have beards down to here. And they have weapons all over them. And you can smell them three miles away as warriors. And with this, the leader said to me, he said, Child, do you want to be a warrior? I said, I am a warrior. He said, you cannot be a warrior unless you know how to kill, how to use a weapon. And for the first time, I shot 30 
bullets into the heaven from the AK-47, seven years old, I was transformed. My life did not belong to me, it belonged to the weapon. I knew I was going to places to change the world. From there, I was escalating. I'm going to sum all this. By the time, all my teenage life, I fought against the Christians in Lebanon, civil war. I did my first mission to Israel, and the second mission to Israel, I was seven years old uh, and eight years old. I, did, I went all the way to, uh, to uh, Syria, and I fought against the Ba'ath Party, which is the Communist Party, and we even killed Muslim brothers, because if they don't line up with my doctrine, then they do not deserve to live. This is what you're dealing with. Then from there, I went and uh, went all the way to, uh, uh, did another mission by the Mediterranean Sea. We took Zodiac boats. We did mission to Israel to go to Haifa to kill, uh, to kill Israelis. And from there, I went, you know, to, uh, to Libya. Muammar al-Qaddafi was like, my, uh, like a father to me. Muammar al-Qaddafi taught me, loved me, financed me. I sat on his table with his, with his uh, wives, and I was, you know, a uh, guest in his house all the time. He called me son. And we opened the biggest university of terrorism in Libya. We were teaching the whole world out there, specifically the South, in South America, the Sandinistian and what so have you, how to become martyrs. Today, martyrism is coming from there. And now, what we taught all those years is manifesting over there. And now, this is how the terrorists are crossing through the borders, $70,000 a pop. It's cheaper for the drug lord to bring a terrorist than bring drugs. I mean, it's better for him financially, and he doesn't have to deal with anything because he brings them over $70,000 a person. American women are being married for about 70, between 40 and $70,000 for the invasion. We were learning all this, how to make it happen. You know, it's by money, 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 petrodollar. Thank you, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was my biggest financier. When I met the Saudi kings, I found out there were more no generosity because why? You can use Koran against them, manipulate them, because the Koran says, he said, if you could not fight physically, you have to fight financially. Or one way or another, whatever your deed is. So you don't have to be anything, but you can be a sleeper cell in here and host terrorists at your home in America. Why? Because you have to fight with something. This is what it's all about. So we were training, and we were training others. We were training, and then I went to Europe to do, uh, I went to Europe to do uh, culture jihad, and we found Europe loves their alcohol more, and more than anything else. Alcohol was failing. We brought more alcohol. We bought more drugs. Drugs, we put it on the street on purpose because when the drugs go to the street and it's cheap and it's better than the drugs that sold on the street, what happened? The character, the couth, everything of the society will start falling. And why? Because we can introduce Islam as resolution. This is done purposely. In America, we did, we bought, oil. we bought, you know, oil from different places. We bought tobacco from North Carolina and South Carolina, and we didn't pay tax on it. The front-end stores like 7-Eleven and different places that they owned by Islamic acted like missionary places. They moved everything behind the scene. The finances were taking place behind those stores. What you see in up front, somebody is laughing and telling you, God bless you, we worship the same God, and we are people like you, but behind the end, in the end scene, it was moving from places, the bloodline from Mideast to America. We were doing it like this. Canadian border, the Canadian Muslim soldiers, they allowed us to come to the United States of America. They told us when they were on a shift, and this is when we crossed the border. They told us when, when to leave, how to move things all the way from Afghanistan to the United States of America. My last war was in Tora Bora. I went to fight the Russian. That's my teenage year. This is my resume. Many people look at me and after they read the book and go like, this is merely impossible to do all this in your lifetime. Well, of course. You lived in one area. You contributed to the area. You died in the area. You probably went to Mexico on vacation or maybe you went down to South Carolina. You know, because there's a good store over there somewhere. 
But in my world, we were living for a cause. And that cause is advancing Islamization. There's no time to sleep. There's no time to eat. There's only time to advance jihad. This is my childhood. By the time I was 19 years old, I've done everything, and I'm now everybody's calling me. Saudi Arabia, Syria, Saddam Hussein, and Hafez al-Assad, both dictators. I work for them indirectly. Money is coming from every place. Come on, do this. Come on, do this. All of a sudden, I huffed and puffed, and I became so just full of myself. And now I thought I am like the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. Why? Because everybody is bound before me. I have the power. My brothers, my friends were getting killed left and right. I carried some of my best friends on my back from different missions. All the reason why I'm telling you this is because I was showing you why somebody asked me earlier, what's the zealousy between American and Mideastern? We were focused on the goal. We were going for a purpose. We we're going to do something. But if you don't have a purpose in life, how will you know where you're going? The Word of God says, how will they know if you don't send them? How will you know? How will they know if, if they, you don't speak to them? How will they know? When America ceased, when the whole Christian world ceased from doing the Word of God, the churches start shutting down. Statistics shows every five and a half days, a new mosque is opened in the United States of America. Some of this, those best mosques are former churches. Why? Because it's called conquest. Where you failed, we have victoriously succeeded you. Billy Graham Church in North Carolina. Stained glass, beautiful children sang hymns to Jesus. Women served and a man came about, gave their offerings, and it was a great church. But today, the voice has changed. The history is different. The children that are running there, they cry, Allahu Akbar. The school that is talking over there, it's teaching Islam. The over there of Jesus Christ is ripped off the wall, and now it's a holy Quran. The world is changing. And if we don't stand for what we believe for, then somebody else, God has sent us mandate us. He said, go in my name and reach them, baptize them, heal them, set them free. But when we don't do this, the enemy will come and change our world. We have nine million Muslims in the United States of America. God has brought us the harvest here to the United States of America. And this harvest, if we don't reach it, it's going to reach us. Remember, I'm going to give you a lesson on Islam 101 for those who doesn't know what Islam is. Allah is the God of Islam. Muhammad is the prophet of Islam. Allah is is a word many people say, well, isn't Allah and, uh, and, uh, and God, Jehovah God Almighty, are the same God? No, they are not. The word in English, uh, the word in Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim is the word of, of, uh, of Jehovah God Almighty. Allah is a word that it pre-existed Islam. It was worshipped with different gods. That God is the only one who was worshipped in Kaaba, which is the highest God. We refer to him as Baal. And that God is the only one that exists because what Baal mean? Does anyone know what Baal mean? Is the one who is Akbar, the one who is greater, the one who is bigger and higher. How do where do we find this? In the book of Isaiah and in the book of Revelation, where God spoke to Satan and he said, You have reasoned in your heart, and you have saw yourself above what? Above God, above the mount, on the mount of assembly. You have raised yourself to that level. So what happened is that guy is still exalting himself. In Arabic, it's called ilah. Ilah mean, means a God. But when you put A-L before it, it becomes Allah, which is, it is completely deceptive word. It sounds like Elohim, but it is not Elohim. It is not the same God. There are two different gods in character and in heart and every way. So today, what the Muslims are facing, they're facing hate and anger, and we were learning how to change the world. Right under Muhammad, there is what's called the Quran. The Quran is deceptive word. It's deceptive. It's a counterfeit. It sounds like the real world, but, uh, word, but it is not the real word. 
So what happened is it deceived millions of Muslims. Now under the Quran, the Quran was given to Allah to Muhammad, uh, from Allah to Muhammad. Under Muhammad, there is what's so called hadith. Hadith is the life, the biography of, uh, of, uh, of Muhammad, also the mandate of Muhammad. Muhammad exalted himself to the level of Allah, and now he is equal to Allah. It says, La ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. So there is no God but Allah and Muhammad his prophet. So now what happened is the hadith and the Quran come together and create what's so called Sharia law. Sharia law is the constitution of Islam. Islam is not a country. There's 57 Islamic country all over the world led by what's so called Islam. Islam is a nation. The nation of Islam is one fifth of the whole world today. That's how big that is. It will take the whole world by sheer number, not by evangelism. By sheer number alone, it will take the whole world. And so what happened is, in the United States of America, they are increasing. There are 100,000 Muslim immigrating to the United States of America. Thank you, White House, for financing this for the last two years. $10 million. $10 million to move specifically Hamas people to the United States of America. Hamas are the enemy of the state. Hamas are radical Islamists to change the United States of America. They are on the Holy Land trial. Anyone heard about the Holy Land trial? Put your hand up. Keep your hand up, please. One, two, three, four, five. Five. Five and a half. Okay. The Holy Land trial, everybody must Google it. If you have not Googled this, you must Google it. Anyone here at home? Put your hand up. It's not for shopping only. <laughs> or, or Facebook. It's also the face of God. You know, this is, check what the Holy Land trial is all about. It's going to reveal a huge agenda. It's a massive but it's the best reading you will ever know because if you need to know what your constitution stands for, you need to understand what the Holy Land trial is specifically the counterfeit of the American constitution. Remember that. Sharia law is a government that lead the Muslim. Islam is not a religion, it's a government. It's a full structure led by Sharia law. It has every component. The highest component is religion, then you have military, then you have the civilian, uh, the civic, and then you have the academia, then you have every level, Sharia law banking, the whole nine yards. What Sharia law does when it comes to our culture, it takes over your culture. It dominates your culture. I'm going to take you somewhere, medic, you know, I saw this on TV the other day, and I was watching it. it, it just showed me exactly what's happening in America. The, the cancer cell when it exists in a body, the body doesn't know what this cancer cell is all about. The, the immune system moves all over and kills every bad cell that uh, exists in the body. But there's one cell, the immune system doesn't know what it is, it's cancer. And when, when the immune system leave it to grow, it becomes stronger and bigger and bigger. Sooner or later, it starts demanding and put pressure on the whole body to take their life out. And the only way you can move it is either by isolating it uh, surgically or nuke it. This is the only way you can burn cancer from the body. So what happened is, Islam came here and according to the teaching of Hadith, Sharia Allah said, befriend your enemy until you subdue them. Befriend your enemy until you subdue them. That cancer cell says, we worship the same God, we're people of peace. According to the statistic, when they are 2% of a nation, they will not do anything. When they increase to 6%, they start raising their voices and let their voices be heard. And when they become 10%, they riot and dominate the culture. And now the whole culture is at fear. Just the lion seen on nature TV with the oxen all over the buffalo and the lion will run at them and they start running and they start falling and killing themselves and now they devour it. Are you listening to me? I, two people. Are you listening to me? Yeah. <sighs> okay. I'm trying to draw the picture. I'm trying to give you a sense, the smell, to hear, to feel. Because you're dealing with something. If you don't do anything about it, it's going to start demanding your, your very own life. Your culture, your finances, your children. Your, your daughter is going to come 
with the hijab on her head and pregnant and said, this is my husband, Abdullah, and you're going to say, and she's going to inherit you. She's going to inherit your finances. Right under Sharia law, there is what's called Khalifa. In the uh, Sunni culture, it's called Khalifa, those who inherit Muhammad. And in the Shia culture, it's called Imam. These are the one, the leaders, right under those leaders, the leaders, according, so this is bringing three levels of Muslim. The first level of Muslim are the Zalat Islamic. The Zalat Islamic are one point, uh, out of 1.5 billion, they are 18 to 22 percent. They're over the size of the United States of America in numbers, over 300 million. That they believe the whole world must be destroyed and subdued by Islam, and if you're not a Muslim, you must be killed for your faith or your belief or whatever, or for lack of belief. This is one, you know, uh, 18 to 22 percent. Then you have the moderate. The moderate could not fight, but yet their uncle, their brothers, their sisters, their family are the Zalat. So the Islam, your loyalty is to Islam. 48 percent of American culture, they said, we are American, uh, we are Muslim first, we are American second. So therefore, if a war broke between America and other country, these people will stand with a Muslim country against the American culture. One in three believe in martyrism. One in three of nine million American Muslims believe in martyrism, that dying for the sake of Allah is, is the right thing to do. That's over three million. I mean, three million. Any way you look at it. Now, right under the Khalifa, you know, the moderate Muslim believe that they could not fight until the Khalifa come and take his place or the Imam come and take his place. And now the whole Muslim world is crying out for whom? the Islamic leader to come and take their place because they're ready to march on. And now everyone is mandated to fight. You know, one time I was listening to this, uh, this man. He is uh, a good author. He was talking about Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan used to take his family, uh, the, his warrior to war, and he used to take the family of the warrior and put it right behind his warriors. Their children, their wives, the grandmother, everybody. Because if the enemy broke through the... Uh, the army line, what happened is then they will kill the family. The armies fought for their life. They gave everything because their children are back there. Their wives are back there. Their herds is back there. He brought the whole thing out. So America today is fighting. You know, if you lose the front line and you do not fight, November is a great time to fight. November is a cause to fight. November is the rise of the American people to, to make their voice heard and make the difference in such time as this because November will either enslave you or either make you victorious. But it is up to you. It's our job to tell everybody about who we are, what we are, and what we're going to do. Your sphere of influence is the most important thing. And if you don't tell anyone about what's taking place, your sphere of influence is going to be belong to somebody else. I came to the United States of America by mandate from the Saudi family. I came for a culture jihad. Culture jihad is what takes, we go to the prison system, we thrive in the prison system, we tell them about Islam, that Islam came to because America has enslaved them, put them behind the jail and called them, you know, weak. So now we are coming to make men out of them. That's how we tell the prisoners. It is Average 2,000 prisoners every year are recruited from the prison system and recruited to assault camp in the United States of America, which is we have over 60 camp, and abroad even to Afghanistan fighting against American armies from our jail system. The neighborhood, the poor neighborhood, is one of the other places that we were very victorious because anytime somebody is downtrodden, you feed them sorrow, you feed them hate, you feed them anger, what happened is you can possess that land because now you feed them more lies and anger and now they will follow you. And as soon as you start giving their children, their boys and girls, jobs in different places in the United States of America, limousine drivers, 7-Eleven, uh, restaurant you know, workers, what you have you, now they believe that you are the one that came to save them. And that's how we did it. Your government. Over 500 lobbyists in America, United States of America, lobbying the American government. The infiltration is to the highest level in the land today. 
We'll talk about that tonight for those who are coming. Your academia, university are paying mil paid millions and millions and millions of dollars. In the last year, Saudi Arabia poured over $10 billion in the United States of America to change your university culture. They buy university to build Islamic centers. They bring in scholarship to American universities. And the Islamic culture will be a mandated study that everyone will have to, to take Islamic classes, especially the freshmen. Statistic, uh, a study was done by the, Baptist, uh, uh, by the best Baptist community that they're losing their men and women as soon as they're heading universities because right there, they have not trained the children what they're going to be facing there at the jail, uh, at the uh, university. Because the Muslim said to our organization, I came to build those in 1980 and 81, specifically Muslim Student Association and Muslim Student Union. These are specifically to confuse the young men and women. The women will be married, the men will be recruited to fight with them. This is where John Taliban was recruited from UC Irvine, who was captured in in Afghanistan fighting against American people. This is where the soldier, another American soldier bombed himself and killed his, his sergeant and killed several other because he was Muslim and they were fighting in Iraq against Islamists. It just the story goes on. This is where the soldier, American soldier, or they convert them to Islam where they become spies to tell about Islam, uh, to tell the Muslim about what's taking place in the American cultures. Then, your student, your student, even in public school today, they are taking classes about Islam in the name of geography. Many American families don't know what your children are taking. They tell them about Muhammad, about Ramadan, about Mecca, about Hajj, about pilgrimage, about names, about, you know, uh, alms. They teach them Islamic things. Sooner or later, they will see there's no difference between Christianity and Islam. They are lying to them, telling them, that both are the same and equal. One has one flavor and the other one has different flavor. When you have United States president saying we worship the same God, the people of peace, it's a junk. This is an infiltration bought by the petrodollar. This is what the petrodollar is doing. When we start isolating well, oil well in the United States of America, learn that they're doing this on purpose to sabotage this culture, to weaken it. When they're enslaving this culture, I want you to learn this phrase. It's the most important phrase you will learn today. And that is, socialism is Islamism. Socialism is Islamism. Everybody say, socialism is Islamism. It's the same side, it's two sides of the coin. One is Islam, one is socialism. Because you could not subdue a culture, you could not bring about Islamization until the culture is subdued completely and now it's dependent to be co, to be a servant just depending on different rules and regulation. And then that's a perfect atmosphere to introduce Islam supreme. Do you understand me? Are you listening to me up there? This is a plan. This is a satanic, dark plan. The Word of God says, I have great plan for you, thus says the Lord, to show you future, to give you future, to give you hope. Nothing by any means shall harm you, but the enemy plan is to subdue you, to destroy you, to enslave you, to make you weak. There are two different plans, one of God and one of Satan it's himself. This is where we're at. We are facing the time the civilization, culture civilization right now, a war for our life. We're standing right there at the edge. America, you must come out of your seats and say, arise, awake, and pray. Amen. When I looked at the American flag, when I became American, I came to understand what the American flag is. At the beginning, I used to hate the flag. Yes, we desecrated the flag. But as I looked at the flag, and I saw the color, the red color, something spoke to me, that freedom is not for free. In order for this white color to take place, this red color has to take place as the top color, 
red, white, and finish by red. And I came to understand that the American people today, you are living in freedom handed to you on a silver platter with a white glove says, here is your freedom. It's bought by your mothers, your grandfathers, and your ancestors that they fought and they gave their life and they gave all for you. But who will stand for those young men and women? 26 and, uh, and younger, stand up. 26 and younger, stand up. You're about to go to sleep. I need to wake you up. No. Who will stand for these young men and women? Who will tell them on their shift nothing will happen to them? Who will tell them I stand for you on a wall today? Who will give them that silver platter and say, go, you're going to have a bright future. Nothing is going to happen to you. Who's going to tell them what you're facing today is your life. You're fighting for your life. Who will tell them, forget about what you're doing today. See what you're doing. These are the children that they're going to be facing, the giants. The Amalekite, one day God says, march against them. They were the giants of the land. And today the giants of the land are marching back. They want to take their land and your land. And today, if we don't teach them to be the Isaac, uh, to be the Jacob, the Isaac, the Joshua, the David of their age, they, not, they have no hope. They don't know the sound of the battle, how the shofar sound when it goes to the battle. In Islam, it said jihad, jihad. How about them? What they will fight for? Who will teach them? Who will show them? Who will pray for them? We pray for health and we pray for finances. How about the rest? Who will send them to say, go in his name? We're fighting for our life, for our future. This is it. Because if they don't get it, you're going to see thousands of mosques in America. In America. We have nearly 3,000 mosques right now. The Islamic centers have been, bought, uh, have been built in place. You know what the Islamic center for? Sharia Supreme Courts, they're already built in America, preparing for Islamic governing. I'll talk about that tonight more. I want everybody to extend your hand toward these young men and women. Let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we ask you right now to lift up these young men and women and bless them in spirit and in truth. Show them your mighty favor. Open the eyes and the ears of their understanding. Bring their senses about, Father God, that they will take your call, that they will stand for you, that they will cry, holy, holy is the Lord. Father God, raise their families to be warriors for them, Father God, to teach them the good and the pure and lovely, to stand for what is good and wholesome, Father God. Father God, put your zealousy in them. Put, out, uh, put the new fire and power of the Holy Spirit in them like never before, that when they go, Father God, that even the ground will shake under their feet and it will be given to them, Father God. Show them your favor, your mighty favor, and loose your blessing over them. Father God, raise them up to be servant after your own heart, Father God, not afraid nor ashamed of the gospel of your name. Father God, protect them. Protect them on their shift. Show them, Father God, what to do. And bring them about the new light, the light of the Holy Spirit, the light of God that reveal to them all the things that they need, for, uh, need of. Father God, we pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and discernment and clarity over them. We pray for breakthrough in their life. Father God, that they are not the average men and women, but they are warriors among warriors. Father God, bless them as we pray for them in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Sit down. 1985, I was driving down the street, and I had this little car. It's so beautiful. It's called Mazda RX-7. Red color, leather seats, Bose system, T-top, five-speed. It, it just hummed like a butterfly. Butterfly doesn't hum. And I'm going down the street, and I'm just praising Allah. You know, I'm just going, going in America from one place to another. Nobody's holding me hostage. I'm free. And all of a sudden, this guy come from the right lane, and he crossed over to my lane, and I hit the brakes, and my car climbed up to the middle of the road, and goes across the street, and an 18-wheeler come and <laughs> embraces me. And my little Mar uh, Mazda RX-7 turned from red beautiful car to red croissant. <laughs> it just was bent over, and I was raptured in the air for about six, seven feet. That's as far as it went. And I hit the ground right on my head, cracked my neck in two places, in a mud hole. And I cried, Allah, where are you? 
Allah didn't come to my rescue. Allah said, as far as the span of the heaven and the earth is my voice from my people. He doesn't speak to his people. And right there, this man came out of nowhere, and he ran to me, and he started looking me in the face, and he said, everything's going to be all right. We're going to take care of you, and everything's going to be all right. And I'm looking at him like, who is this idiot? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I do for a living? He's promised me, we're going to take care of you. Who are we? And everything's going to be all right. What are you going to do? My God is greater than yours. Bucko. <laughs> and with this, this man took his t-shirt off, he cleaned the mud from my face, blocked the sun from my face, and he, by that time, you know, he called the ambulance, the ambulance came on the way, picked me up and took me where? To the hospital. As I arrived at the hospital, in the ER room, this orthopedic surgeon came and he looked at my chart, he said, your name is Kamal Salim, you're a French citizen. You have no friend, you have no family, you have no insurance, you have no life. With his little mustache and sudden accent, he looked at me, he said, son, we're going to take care of you now, you hear? And everything's going to be all right. I'm going like, I heard that before. In terrorism, this is when you are being mapped because our job is to map your culture and send a report to our superiors to tell them where your culture is. And so I've been mapped that day because these people spoke the same language. And now the second day I wake up in the hospital and this Mr. Muscle, he come in walking, flexing his muscle. He has six packs, you know, and he's Mr. Physical Therapy. Dude, dude, dude. You're in deep, dude. <laughs> you're in trouble. He didn't say it this way. He said, you're really in trouble. But he said, you know what? We're going to take care of you, and everything's going to be all right. And every time they said that, I looked at their face, and they have this little smile on their face. <laughs> they smile while they insult you. I'm going, the jinn has found me. I've been mapped out and they're going to kill me. And now what I'm going to do, I can't run away because I could not move my body was completely, could not move it. So now I'm thinking about all this and I'm really scared. In terrorism, if you're left behind, you have to find your way in. It's not like the American army, nobody is left behind. Because if you're revealed, then your whole terrorist group is revealed. And now you're in trouble. So now I'm sitting in the hospital on the fifth day. The first guy came and he's visiting me and he's looking at me just like this. And he's talking to me like, how are you doing? I'm going like, that's an American junk. You know, how are you doing? You mean it. Don't just come and see me. You know. And the second guy walked in, the surgeon. And instead of looking at Kamal, he looked at the guy and he said, well, so and so, what are you doing here? He said, oh, this is the guy I told you about. I'm going like, they know each other. That's not good. In terrorism, this is very bad. Then to make the story, Mr. Sixpack walked in. And instead of saying, good morning, Kamal, he looked at the other guy and said, well, guys, what are you doing here? I, I thought, oh, my God, he called them guys. Just like George W. Bush called them folks. And I go like, they know each other. And they start hugging each other and kissing each other and telling each other, I love you. And I'm going like, oh my God, they're not just Christian, they're foofy Christians. <laughs> they hug and kiss and love. Take your hand off him while you hug him and kiss him. This is not kosher. <laughs> no, I'm looking, I'm good. These guys, it's amazing. You can surrender to the Lord or God will send you an 18-wheeler <laughs> to make you surrender. And he will put you in a corner and he will lock on your jaws until you come and say uncle. Or in that side of the world, it says uncle. You know, the way they say it. So and with this, they start debating among themselves who's going to take me home because the hospital is going to discharge me. And now they're arguing with each other. I'm going like, this is not good. The first thing I was making sure they have rings on their fingers. <laughs> Nobody's going to take me home. I'd rather die. It's, 
This is a big no-no. In Islam, homosexuals are thrown from the cliff or beheaded. They're killed. This is how we cure homosexuality over there. So with this, the, the, uh, the orthopedic surgeon won the whole thing. And now he ushered me to his home. They take me over there and they put me in a big room. That room was so big, I've never seen a size of a room like this. But the worst part was it's full of white lace and pink lace on the windows, on the bed, on the credenzas. It was fluffy. <laughs> There's a big bed was this high and it has a ladder to climb up there. All my life I slept on the floor. I never took a ladder to sleep. <laughs> they refer to it as rice bed. It's made from rice. It has columns. That's what I thought. It's made from rice, but it has rice blades all over it. The mattress was this thick and filled up with feather. Goose, feather down, whatever. And it was so thick, and the minute they laid me on it, and I felt the peace of God in the first time in my life. And as I was sitting there on that bed that day, three little children climbed on the bed, and they start calling me, Welcome home, Uncle Kamal. And I start screaming at them, I am not your uncle! Monkeys, get out of the bed! I am not your uncle! The three little children, they laid hand on me, and they start praying for me, the Jesus prayer. I was trained to kill the best soldiers. I was trained to fight the best of the best, and I had no fear. Because I understood to die is the right purpose. The Word of God says to live is Christ and to die is gain. And for those who do not believe in God, Henry Patrick said, give me liberty or give me death. I lived that life. I didn't just say it. These little hands pierced right through my spirit, man. And now they're subduing me. And I came to the place where I could not fight this great warrior. He's the essence of love. He's the es essence of truth. Because those purity were so more powerful. They prayed for me in love for my healing without knowing me. The next thing, I start finding out that these people have a relationship with their God. The way they treated the women, the husband was cleaning the bathroom for God's sake. Don't do it, man. This is not right. <laughs> they were changing diapers. This is a no-no. There's poop in there. <laughs> These men are teaching their boys and girls at home. I'm going like, bad, bad man. The next thing is, now these people are reading the Bible, and as they're reading the Bible, I heard them many times, Oh, I heard God speaking to me. I'm going like, where? <laughs> Let me hear him. Oh, I just asked for this, and he gave me this word. Wow, how can you get this magic? Can I purchase it? It's free. Well, how do I get it? Jesus Christ, well, I don't want it. This is what I was introduced to. These people never told me you should be a Christian. They showed me to be a Christian. These people did not speak the word of the Bible over me. They wear the Bible. These people did not shine their light on me. They wear the light. These people understood. The lady was sick that night and she was supposed to cook. They came and laid hand on her and they cried and they prayed for her and she was healed. And she walked and she became Martha Stewart. She started doing the vegetable scene. <laughs> I'm going, how do you do that? It's yours for free. How? Jesus, I don't want it. I'm watching all this. And now I'm watching the relationship evolve. The husband served the wife. The wife served the husband. The children praised these people came, 60 men, they stood up in a circle, they're businessmen, organization, and they held hand like a sissy girls, and they put me in the center of the circle and they prayed for me. I'm going, don't hold hand while you're praying like this. They're praying for Kamal Salim that God will heal him, that God will give him a future, that God will change his heart from stone to flesh, that God give him the love, the light, the truth. That God will bless him. At the end of the night, they put a big basket. In the basket says for Kamal Salim, they wrote checks and they forgave my debts in full. 
I had more money than all of them combined. The check that came from Saudi Arabia, I combined all their home, I can buy it and buy a university and buy a hospital and then some. But these guys, out of their need, gave. To make the story short, one day the doctor, the surgeon, and I don't say his name, I'm trying to protect his name all the time, he brought a bunch of keys and he said, Kamal, this is your new keys to the house. You have keys to the house, now you can go. You don't have to stay here, you're feeling a lot better. And there's extra key out there, this is a key for your brand new car, 280ZX. I fell in love with those Christians, they know how to give gifts. 280ZX, when you change gear, the whole car moved. I mean, T-top, blue, Bose system, oh man. With this now, I'm falling in love with these people. I said, I'm not feeling well. Can I stay a couple more weeks? <laughs> I'm hugging Jewish people there. They have a lot of Jewish people coming to their home. They support Israelis. I'm making tabbouleh and hummus. I'm babysitting. <laughs> I changed from warrior to foofy. Warrior, if my mother's, if my mother and my brothers and my warrior brothers sees me, they will spit on me. They will just deny me. And now, I'm going home in defeat for the second time. I'm confused because there's a, this Christianity that is complete opposite of Islam, but it's the purity and essence of the love, love of God. Everything that they showed me, it was beautiful. I was falling in love. I want to marry these, marry those people and be part of their life. I don't want to let go. They set the example. They fed me the example. Now, I went to my home for the first time defeated, and I opened my door to my house, and the dust is this thick. I was allergic to vacuum cleaners. I was waiting to get married someday. I was saving it for my wife. And with this, I went inside. I went inside. I fell on my knees before the eastern window, and I put my hand to the heaven before Allah. And I cried to my God. I said, Allah, Rabbi wa Mawlai. Allah, my Lord and my King. Why have you done such a thing to me? I don't mind the accident. I don't mind being paralyzed or died for you. But you put me among Christians. I'm confused. These people are good people. I never knew who they were until I saw them. These people are lovers, but they're stupid. They're going to be killed someday. They have no idea what's happening in their land. I said, Allah, these people have relationship with their God. They cry for healing, they receive healing. They cry for breakthrough, they receive breakthrough. I want to have a relationship with you too. I want to hear that you love me if you're real, speak to me. I'm crying to my God and I'm in earnestly hoping to have that relationship that I tasted over there. It is for freedom I have set you free. That freedom is bought. And if you don't know how to buy freedom, you need to read the Bible. That day I came to an understanding that everything I've done for Islam is what I brought to Islam. Where was Islam before Kamal? I came to understand that it's a lie, that everything that I've done is not even real. And I start balancing everything. If I go tell my family I'm no longer a Muslim and this Allah doesn't work for me, my dad will kill me himself. My brothers, as a matter of fact, they have hundreds of thousands on my head. By my cousin, he has millions. The Muslim Brotherhood has millions. The Saudi family have millions. My family has millions. I mean hundreds of thousands. PLO has millions on my head. I was your best soldiers. I was the one who trained your daughters and your sons. I was the one who protected you. Well, you left Islam. Now you're the enemy of the state of Islam. Now, if I go tell my brothers, you know, in, in, in war, in jihad, this is what happened to me, they will kill me. So I thought, finish this war. Clock out. I get up. And as I get up, I thought, I'll challenge Allah. Because in Islam, it says, if you challenge Allah, He will kill you if you're a Muslim. And that day, I challenged Him. I said, if I die today, and I see your face, and you tell me, Kamal Salim, you're going to hell because you killed yourself, I said to Him, I'd rather, I said, I'm gonna, I'd rather live in hell than being with you because you're a liar and a father of lies. 
I said that to him. And I thought the sword is truly going to come down if Allah is true, but the sword never came down. So I went to reach out my gun, and as I'm about to reach for it, I heard the voice for the first time in my life. It was a tangible voice, a voice like a father voice, a voice that knew me, a voice that loved me like a son. And he said, come on, come on, come on. He's calling me like a son. He said, the Muslim, the Jews and the Christian, they cry to God of Father Abraham and they call him. He said, will not you call on God of Father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? The minute I heard this, I fell on my knees and I put my hand to the heavens, to my God, uh, to, to God, and I called on him and I said, God the Father Abraham, if you are real, would you speak to me? God the Father Abraham, if you are real, I want to know you. Well, I was sitting there and the room was transformed. He came to the room and he filled the room with his glory. He stood there and the heaven, the host of heaven was there and you just can feel the whole world is right there at his feet. And I said to him, who are you my Lord? He said, I am that I am. I said, what is that supposed to mean? I'm a Bedouin. All I know is how to fight. What I know, what do I do, what is that supposed to mean? He said, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am everything that is in between. I have known you before I formed the foundation of the earth. <clears throat> I have loved you before I formed you in your mother womb. Rise up. You are my warrior. You are not their warrior. The word of God says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that day, as I rose, my neck was intact. My knee was intact. My ribs were intact. My collarbone was intact. I was completely brand new. The doctors before and after look at the x-rays and they go like, it doesn't make sense which one is before or which one is after. I'm going, his name is Jesus. And they go like, what do you mean his name is Jesus? I said, he did it. That day when I saw him, I said, he had holes in his hand. On his head, he wore the Jewish shawl. He did not change his citizenship. He did not change his identity. He is I am that I am. God is yes and amen from beginning to end. God does not change. He is the Alpha and Omega. And now I came to know him. And as he stood there, I said, My Lord, my Lord, I will live and die for you. He said, Do not die for me. I died for you that you may live. Yeah. It's on the house, baby. It's on him. I said, I will go and grab them by the skin of their teeth and by their eyelashes and I will make them Christians. Give me a challenge. He said, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Be an ambassador of mine. I start jumping up and down. I am the ambassador of God. I am the ambassador of God. I am the ambassador of God. But when I went to the world out there, I found there's millions of ambassadors, but they don't know what their citizenship is capable of doing. They are a royal priesthood. They are the children. He called them sons and daughter. He called you friend. He called you salt and light. He called you his remnant. But many of them refused it and walked away. We change our identity from an eagle to an ostrich. We hit our sin, head in the sand and we said, we don't need you. We read the word of God here and there and we said, okay. But we don't put it through work. The word has power. Has life. The first man I led to Christ, I don't think that he has children today. He was living across the street from me. He had different parties in his house. He drank. He had different girls. And that day when I saw him, I ran to him, to his car, and I started screaming at him, I am Christian. I am Christian. I am Christian. And so should you. He said, all right already. Don't hurt me. I'm going, praise God, it's working. <laughs> but the Lord reminded me, it's not a Muslim style. It's God's style. With this, agree with me. Father God, we pray as Ramadan, the month of Ramadan is about ending right now. We pray that you invade the Muslim world with your glory, with your love, with your truth, with your light, with your hope, with the fruit of the Spirit and the gifting of the Spirit, that these people will come from every nation and tongue, and they will come and celebrate you in spirit and truth. 
Father God, we pray that you open the eyes and the ears of their understanding, that they will come to know you. Father God, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit on them. In Jesus' name. 136,000 Chinese came to Christ last year. 100, 136 million Chinese came to Christ last year. That's a million, 136 million. God is moving, and he said he will build the church and the power of hell cannot prevail. Join me, be in the army of God. Let's pray for the Muslim. Reach them in truth, because the fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous man availeth much. And if we pray, we move the hand of God, because we are the children of God. Tonight, we'll be talking about a lot of things. We'll go into the infiltration and the doctrine and the ideology of Islam and even what's happening in the White House, our military forces, our homeland security, and all those places, and what is the Cordoba Initiative and what's the purpose and what is the starting in this culture, and who is Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, which is the leader United, the American, to lead the United States of America. Just these are hints for tonight. Thank you for listening to me, and may God bless you and prosper you. Tonight, I want to share with you several things, but first, I want to show you something. It's stunning. I want you to look at this, and uh, are we prepared to play this? Let's go ahead. And... Okay, and then I'll take a seat. I'll take my water. Where is it at? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. to research, in order for a culture to maintain itself for more than 25 years, there must be a fertility rate of 2.11 children per family. With anything less, the culture will decline. Historically, no culture has ever reversed a 1.9 fertility rate, a rate of 1.3 impossible to reverse, because it would take 80 to 100 years to correct itself and there is no economic model that can sustain a culture during that time. In other words, if two sets of parents each have one child, there are half as many children as parents. If those children have one child, then there are one-fourth as many grandchildren as grandparents. If only a million babies are born in 2006, it's hard to have two million adults enter the workforce in 2026. As the population shrinks, so does the culture. As of 2007, the fertility rate in France was 1.8, England 1.6, Greece 1.3, Germany 1.3, Italy 1.2, Spain 1 1.1. Across the entire European Union of 31 countries, the fertility is a mere 1.38. Historical research tells us these numbers are impossible to reverse. In a matter of years, Europe as we know it will cease to exist. Yet the population of Europe is not declining. Why? Immigration. Islamic immigration. Of all population growth in Europe since 1990, 90% has been Islamic immigration. France, 1.8 children per family. Muslims, 8.1. In southern France, traditionally one of the most populated church regions in the world, there are now more mosques than churches. 30% of children ages 20 and younger 
are Islamic. In the larger cities such as Nice, Marseille and Paris, that number has grown to 45 percent. By 2027, one in five Frenchmen will be Muslim. In just 39 years, France will be an Islamic Republic. In the last 30 years, the Muslim population of Great Britain rose from 82,000 to 2.5 million, a 30-fold increase. There are over 1,000 mosques, many of them former churches. In the Netherlands, 50% of all newborns are Muslim, and in only 15 years, half of the population of the Netherlands will be Muslim. In Russia, there are over 23 million Muslims. That's one out of five Russians. 40% of the entire Russian army will be Islamic in just a few short years. Currently in Belgium, 25% of the population and 50% of all newborns are Muslim. The government of Belgium has stated one third of all European children will be born to Muslim families by 2025 just 17 years away. The German government, the first to talk about this publicly, recently released a statement saying, the fall in the German population can no longer be stopped. Its downward spiral is no longer reversible. It will be a Muslim state by the year 2050. Muammar al-Qaddafi of Libya said, there are signs that Allah will grant victory to Islam in Europe without swords, without guns, without conquest. We don't need terrorists. We don't need homicide bombers. The 50 plus million Muslims in Europe will turn it into a Muslim continent within a few decades. There are currently 52 million Muslims in Europe. The German government said that number is expected to double in the next 20 years to 104 million. Closer to home, the numbers tell a similar story. Right now, Canada's fertility rate is 1.6, nearly a full point below what is required to sustain a culture. And Islam is now the fastest growing religion. Between 2001 and 2006, Canada's population increased by 1.6 million, 1.2 of those immigration. In the United States, the current fertility rate of American citizens is 1.6. With the influx of the Latino nations, the rate increases to 2.11, the bare minimum required to sustain a culture. In 1970, there were 100,000 Muslims in America. Today, there are over 9 million. The world is changing. It's time to wake up. Three years ago, a meeting of 24 Islamic organizations was held in Chicago. The transcripts of that meeting showed in detail their plans to evangelize America through journalism, politics, education, and more. They said, we must prepare ourselves for the reality that in 30 years, there will be 50 million Muslims living in America. The world that we live in is not the world in which our children and grandchildren will live. The Catholic Church recently reported that Islam has just surpassed their membership numbers. Some studies show that at Islam's current rate of growth, in five to seven years, it will be the dominant religion of the world. As believers, we call upon you to join the effort to share the gospel message with the changing world. This is a call to action. What do you think? What do you think? You can. What do you think? Right. The Word of God teaches us that when God loves a nation, He teaches us and He sent us messengers and He sent us hope. This is a good time for America to step 
forward and make the difference because the agenda of the Islamists is being revealed as it's been Well, that's a good word, that's what he said. He said, we are boarding our children. If we, since abortion came about, we, are, we have lost over 80 million child. 80 million child. If we have not aborted those children today, America will be so sufficient in number of people to do the work in here instead of sending it all the way to China. Instead of doing you know, all kind of crazy thing, we could have done it here in our homeland but this is part of the the curses that we deal with you know when we murder children but nevertheless tonight I want to talk about the infiltration it's no longer invasion of Islam to the United States of America now the rank is infiltrating our country it is within our walls it is within our structure government military homeland security on many, many, many level. Before I go further, I want to get this out of my way. In here, we have product. All of them are informational. This is specifically to teach about all this. This one here, it's called Third Jihad, which is why the Muslim are coming to do the final jihad. Islam has committed two jihad already, and both of them were powerful. One subdued the Arabian Peninsula, the second one all the way to Europe, Russia, and China, and now the United States of America. That's the Grand Jihad. The second one is my book, Kamal Salim, you know, The Blood of Lambs, and it's my story in a nutshell. That could have been seven times bigger than this. This is here, a study for, you know, Christian how to reach Muslim and teach you about a lot of uh, Muslim standards. This one here, Dreams, is how Jesus Christ is appearing to the millions of Muslims all over the world and how the Muslims are coming to Christ. As we mentioned this morning, last year over 60 million Muslims came to Christ. That is powerful, isn't it? This is time to say, thank you, Jesus. This is time to express your gratitude to God because God is doing the job whether we're doing it or not. He said, I will build the church and the power of hell will not prevail. The church time has come right now for the warrior to arise. And this is the message. This is Kamal Salim in a red chair, which is my story in a movie. This one here, interview with a terrorist and revealing the agenda of terrorism and is Islam religion of peace? What is the treatment of women in Islam? Do we serve the same God? Is lying permitted in Islam? What are the faces of jihad? What are the mosques and what the mosques are for? This is how they are right now, they demonizing and the exodus, demonizing the Christian and Jew, the exodus of the Jewish people to Israel. Israel rose by one million Jewish people today the first language in Tel Aviv is French it's not Hebrew because the French are running all over the Jewish French running back to Israel and the Christian Arabs are running from all over the world of the Muslim world running to United States of America because they have no place to go this is the last and the final frontier this is obsession what obsessed the Muslim to do what they're doing and how they're doing it and what is the doctrine behind it? This is Islam, what the West need to know. This is a powerful one that I recommend highly. And last but not least is Islam rising. And this one is nearly four hours teaching on Islam and what Islam means in many different ways. And there's one, it's on Islam and prophecies, which is really powerful too. In here, there is two, two little DVDs. You know, these are, we sell them, we're not selling them, we open them for donation. This is the Jesus film, which is we give to the Muslim. This is done in 16 Islamic language, and this is in nine Islamic language. This is Magdalena delivered from shame, how the woman is treated in Christianity versus Islam. And this is information about who we are. What I described this morning, our ministry is called Qum ministry. Qum is an Aramaic word where Jesus, you know, Christ talked to Lazarus, and when he stood outside of the graveyard, of Lazarus which was in the cave and he says Lazarus come Lazarus arise Jesus did not speak Latin he did not speak Hebrew he did not speak Arabic he spoke Aramaic and when he said arise arise 
Because when God arises someone, He is sending him on a journey. He's arising you to say, go. The last mandate that Jesus Christ gave, He said, go in my name. Where? To the all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Lay your hand on the sick. Show them what God has done for you. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Testify what God has done for you. Then he went to Talithia, Talithia's home and he said, when he arrived at Talithia, he stopped, you know, that day, you know, his, her father, he said, Talithia is dying. Would you come and pray for her? And Jesus said, all right, he would. And as he was going, he stopped by Wally World and he shopped. <laughs> there was some good things on sale and then he stopped by Target, French organization. And he did a few things and he arrived really late. And everybody was going like, dude, where have you been? The girl's dead. Go home. He said, she's not dead. She's asleep. So he reached her by the hand and he said, Delicia, cool me. And the new life was given to her. The power of Jesus Christ is the risen power because he died and he rose again. And that power today is in you. Say, his power is in me. That is the power of God that he conquered hell, sin, and death. And this power today, he said, greater things you will do than I because I go before the Father. And this is the time for the church to arise. So when he arrives the church, he is sending you. Otherwise, he said, be still and know that I'm God. Our hope is to reach out the American church and wake them up and let them know about the love of Christ, that Christ is waiting for you to come back home. And God stands every day on a hill. He crying for his sons and daughter. Where are you? I stand on a hill every day. I have a robe of righteousness. I have a signet ring and a sandal of peace to give it to you, my sons, my daughters. I stand every day crying and I wonder where you are. Have you had enough from the world yet? Have you served the pig and ate the, the pig's food? It's time to come and dine in your father table. For in my house there are many mansions. And he waits on the hill every day and he cry for his sons and his daughter. And he send them a terrorist from the other side of the world to tell them, I'm missing you. This is a call to action. The second one is to educate them about the radical Islam invasion that is taking place in the United States of America and the whole world. And the third level is to reach God people, the Muslims. Jesus died for the Muslim too. Amen. Our message is not message of hate and anger. Our message is salt and light. It's to bring truth to the people, to the whole world. Jesus brought the truth to the whole world. But nevertheless, we do not compromise. We do not medicate. We do not change our word just to be nice. We say it as it is. We love them to life because it's the truth that sets humanity free. Amen. And now, when we reach to the Muslim and love the Muslim, it is by his goodness and by his kindness that he led us to repentance. It is the goodness of God that makes place for us to come. And this is a place for all those Muslims out there that they have none. Israel wandered in the desert for, four, for 40 years, but the Muslim been there for thousands of years wandering in the desert. He said, be a city on a hill, a light that let your light shine, my son, my daughter. Because it is your light, the light of God that he's given you. You are the salt and the light of God. And when you walk, God will give you the land. He said, fear not, for the Lord your God is with you. Which one we didn't understand, God with us or fear not? We can witness to each other. In those four walls we can bless each other oh good to see you you sit on my seat move out oh I love you let's have lunch together and let's break bread and do something but this is not what church is all about it is your Jerusalem your Judea your Samaria the whole world and this is your time and this hour because the talents that God given you are specific and unique what have you done with them you are a talent yourself what have you done with yourself today? You fed yourself, you went to the shower, that's a good start. You shaved. 
most of us. And many of us did a lot of things. We paid tithe. We just blessed some other people. And we did a lot of things, but there's more. There's people out there that are living in the darkness, blind, deaf, dumb, broken, in the jail, hungry, thirsty. They have not seen the goodness that you have today. And that's what the message is all about. And I'm going to talk about terrorism, and I'm speaking, preaching the goodness of God right now. I went to Seattle. One of, uh, where's my bodyguard? I took him the first time with me to Seattle. There was a Muslim festival. There were over 400 Muslim. Oh, don't worry about it. Here he is. He went with me the first time to Seattle. There were over 400,000 Muslims. And we went among the Muslim, handed them the Jesus film, the Kamal Salim in red chair, and many other tracks to let them know that Jesus loves them. And Kevin was looking at me. He said, are you in your right mind? I said, this is maybe not for you. Maybe you need to go home. This is a job for somebody who decides to make a difference. So now we went over there to, uh, to Seattle, and now as I'm walking around doing this, this big guy, his name is Majid, he came and running at me, and he screamed at me. He said, today is your last day, and you will not live beyond this day. I'm going to kill you. He has more muscles than, than anyone I've seen on his arms. And I started crying out to the Lord. I said, Lord, bid me to take him out. Imagine screaming at me and the Muslims start forming all around. And I said, Lord, bid me to take him out. I'm crying to the Lord, just give me permission. And the Lord, I heard the voice of God, he said, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. I said, is that you, Lord? <laughs> and he said, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I grabbed Majid's hand like this, and I locked on his wrist with the other one, so he could not punch. <laughs> That's a trick. And I started telling him my story. And I told him my story. And I told him my story. And Majid started asking questions now. And I'm going, okay, praise you, Jesus. It's working. And now, after I told him this, I told him about how I came to Christ, which is those who didn't come and hear it this morning. You missed on it. Get the tape. And, uh, and what happened is, I told him about all this, and I said, let us cry to Allah, the God of Islam, and let us cry to Jesus Christ. If Allah answer, I will be a servant for seven years. I'll wear a nose ring and an ear ring. It says, belong to Majid. I'll serve you any way you want me to serve you. I'll bow down, I'll clean, I'll be your servant, your slave. But if Jesus Christ answer, you're free for the rest of your life. Fair? No. It's fair. So with this, Majid didn't know what to do. He started shaking and his forehead started beating. And he started, didn't know what to do. And the Lord showed me to his heart. He's in a place where it says checkmate. Because if he said yes, what happened is, then Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he said no, then Jesus, then Allah is not a God. And he didn't know what to say. So I grabbed his hand again and I started telling Majid, and I started crying out to the Lord. I said, Dear Lord Jesus, your word said, if we lift up your name, you'll draw all the nations unto us. I bring you magic. Do something with him right now. I have no idea what to do, but you do. Help me, Lord. I'm crying. I'll tell you what. When you come to that place and when you cry earnestly, the fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Majid pulled his arm, his hand from both my hands, and he put his hand on his ear. And he starts saying, I hear his voice. I hear his voice. I hear his voice. I hear his voice. Goliath, that day one, hit the dust. And Goliath could not get up. And the Muslim going, this is haram, this is forbidden, this is not right. He received Christ. Half an hour later, he brought his cousins. They received Christ. By sunset, he brought two of his best friends, radical Islamists. They received Christ. By the end of the day, we had 42 Muslims came to Christ. The battle belonged to the Lord. <laughs> to God be the glory. The reason why I'm telling you this is to let you know that the battle does not belong to you. He said, 
Let the Lord, let God arise and let his enemy be scattered and let the righteous be glad and let those who rise against him put, be put to shame. The battle doesn't belong to you, but you have to give it to God. Amen. And when you give it to God, God goes before his armies. This is how the battle is won. And today, when we bring 42 Muslims to Christ, it's because his word is yes and amen. amen. I was reading one day in, in a book, I was reading this book, and I read this statement. It says, this man who's talking this, in his speech, he said, in the first place, we should insist that if the immigrant who comes here in good faith becomes Amer become American and assimilate himself or herself to us, he shall be treated as an exact equality with everyone else. For it is an outrage to discriminate against any such man because of greed or birthplace or origin, but this is pre pre uh, predicated upon the person becoming in every facet an American and nothing but an American. There can be no divided alliance here. Any man who says he is an American, but something else also is not an American at all. We have room but for one flag, the American flag. We have room but one language here, that is the English language. And we have room here but for one sole loyalty, and that is a loyalty to the American people. 1907, Theodore Roosevelt. The time has changed from Theodore Roosevelt to Barack Hussein Obama. One is fighting for this country, one is infiltrating this country. When Obama was running for a president, and he put one hand like this, and the other hand like this, and he was doing the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America's flag, I'm looking at this, and I'm going, is that for real? In Islam, this is your loyalty and submission to Allah when you're praying. The Muslim pray five times a day this way. They don't pray this way. This is the American way. So therefore, when he was doing this, the whole Muslim world were laughing, and he was giving them signal, I am a stilt, Islamic, militant, hiding to do what I have to do. The finances start pouring from all over the world. $45 million were raised from Saudi Arabia alone. At the end, he had over $450 million came to him for his presidency. While America slept, the American while Americans slept, the enemy have moved. The Trojan horses are set in high places in your world. When a Muslim does this, he's saying, Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen la sharika lah wa bizalika umirtuhu wa ana awwal al muslimin. What does that mean? My life, my death, my every breath, my family, everything is belong to you in martyrdom. There is no God but you, and I am the first martyr for Allah. That's what it means. This morning we talk about the, the two sizes of the Muslim coin. One size, it says socialism, and the second size says Islamism. Islam is socialism. These are the ism family. You have communism, socialism, Nazism, all the isms are related to one another. When Hitler did what he did, it, he did not do what he has done because he was brilliant about what to do against the Jews. The Grand Mufti of, of Jerusalem, Hajj al-Amir al-Husseini, he flew in secrecy to Germany and he taught Hitler how to enslave the Jews. It was Umar ibn Khattab, the second Khalifa after Muhammad, who did put the badges on the, uh, on the, in the Jews and put the tattoos, to tattoo them with their names and their numbers. This was Islamic trade because the Muslim did the same thing to slavery. When they went to Africa and captured African and came and sold them to America as slave, this is how the slave came to America. They were captured by Islamists. This is the trade that Jefferson sent the armies to fight right there by Morocco and by Algeria and by 
that northern Africa over there to fight the free the American and European people from being enslaved captured by Islamic pirates are you listening to me this is a shock to your system you are gonna say this is crazy no it's not my people perish for the lack of knowledge and if American people start using Google for other than shopping pornography eating doing other things we will learn so much because the computer is an instrument of knowledge and power. Hajj al Amin Husseini raised three regiments from Chechnya and from Bosnia. These were Muslim soldiers that they fought against, uh, with Hitler against the Jews. They killed more Jewish people than any other G uh, German uh, Nazi, Nazi German soldiers. Google that. Everything that I'm saying, you should write, you should take note, and say Kamal Salim is lying. You should check for yourself if it's true. Because if it's true, then it's your call too. It's not mine alone anymore. I wrote several things and I thought, where do I start by telling the American people and educate them about the infiltration or about last Christmas, what took place? Last Christmas, Barack Hussein Obama it was on Friday. It fell Christmas Day fell on Friday. Barack Hussein went to the mosque in Washington DC and he prayed in a mosque down the street from the White House. The media didn't put it out there. Why? Because the media is bought by Islamic finances. Billions of dollars has been poured into our media, into our education, into our government, into every every way of life. Apple uh, all the computer system, the IT, the medical industry, the pharmaceutical industry is being bought by Islamic money. The stock exchange is being bought by Islamic fund. Fox News is bought. The majority holder of Fox News, the majority stockholder is Prince bin Talal of Saudi Arabia. Why are they investing in, in all this? Because they can pull their power in there and they can shut down the whole thing overnight. Forbes magazine, which is Christian, 6% was bought this year by Prince bin Talal. Forbes. This infiltration is allowed to happen. What happened between Bush and Obama? What has taken place? One disallowed and one is allowing. We had, we had the power to stop Iran from having nuclear power. But on the other way, he played the game that the Muslim play. You see, in a Muslim world, if my brother and I were going down the street and the other gangs came against us and we're fighting against them. So what we do is my friends will come try to make peace between us and they will hold the other guy on purpose so he could not hit me. But yet they will not hold me. They'll free my hand to go and punch him. And yet they're making peace in the name of peace. And America has been sucker punched several times already, and American people says, turn the other cheek. Give me more. We're becoming so used to abu being abused. November is very, very good time to go vote Jesus Christ. We don't vote independent. We don't vote Republican. We don't vote Democrat. We vote Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything shall be added unto you. Your politician should be asked, even if they're conservative politician, if you're voting for him, tell him, do you believe that we worship the same God as a Muslim God? Put them to accountability. Do you believe Islam is a religion of peace? Do you believe these are your mandates? Because you could not blame things on them after you have voted for them. First, it's shame on them. Now, it's shame on me. So it's our job to stand up for what is right. And that is the right things to do as God people. To be wise as serpent and innocent as dove. We go in our community, we get involved in every level. Your council should not be strangers. They should not be liberal. You are the council of every state. You are the council of your city. You are the board of education. You are the house of reps. You are the senators. You are the presidents. You are everything God has given you. The understanding, the wisdom, the knowledge. And he has given you his glory. 
He's given you everything that you need. Fear not. I am with you, says the Lord. Amen. Oh, well, oh, oh, Lord, is that you? I want to punch him. You saw the demographic. By sheer number, they will take the world. But nevertheless, our, our time is not up. The finest hour of the church is upon us. The church will do a glorious thing. The church will awake. Because this is what God says. He said, if you don't praise me, the rock will cry out. And what he's doing, he's raising up the rock. Many people are coming to Christ because the heat is going to accelerate. And this acceleration, you can learn from it because the line has been drawn in the sand. Which side are you going to stand on? There's a story in the Bible, which is, I read it again and again and again and again. Ten brides going where? To meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish and five were wise. But nevertheless, at the midnight hour, almost at the midnight hour, all of them went to sleep. And when they went to sleep, what happened? Jesus Christ came and woke them up. Five were filled, their basket were filled with oil, and five had none. The line has been drawn in the sand. Are we wise? Are we fool? It's a decision everyone has to make. Love is a decision. Work is a decision. Marriage is a decision. Going to school is a decision. Everything you do in your life is a decision. What are you deciding today to do? For me and my house, we will worship the Lord. Let me share something with you. These articles I was putting out and about, and I never put my name out there because there's a lot of people that loves me. <laughs> and I don't attract them to me again. When President Obama stood in Egypt on June 4th, 2009, what did he say? He said, America is no longer is a Christian country. He's dismantling our country from being Christian. He said, it's a Muslim. It's a Christian. It's a Jew. What is he making place for? Cordoba Initiative. Who wrote the speech for him? Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, the head of the one who's opening Cordoba Initiative Mosque, Ground Zero Mosque, down the street in New York. How do we know this? Because he boasted in Middle East, he was speaking, and he spoke in Arabic, and I understood Arabic. He said, who wrote the speech to the president? It is me. In his book, what he said in his book, a new ideology, new ideas for Americans. That's what he referred to. But he called it in Arabic, the house of, you know, the call of prayer from the rubble of, uh, rubble of ground zero. That's what he referred to his book. It's deception. What, it, what you need to know is what they're saying in Arabic and not what they're saying in English. Because what they said in Arabic, they could not deny because they have to tell the truth. We talked about today, uh, al taqiya Do you remember what al taqiya was? Put your hand up. Six. Okay, seven. Hey, you put it twice, sir. That is al taqiya I was talking about my mother teaching about two kind of, of sins. The first one is the sin that you lie about, which is dark sins. And the second one were the white sins. The white sin is when you lie to, to extend and, uh, you know, expand and advance Islamization of a nation. This is considered righteousness. Muhammad referred to it in the Holy Quran, the generous Quran. He referred to it in a surah called Al-Ahdab, which is the parties. And he said in there, he said to one of his spies, go spies on my family before he killed his Quraysh tribes. And what did he say? The man said to him, well, if I go there, I have to lie about you and you kill people like me. He said, whatever you say, for the sake of Allah, me and Islam, it is forgiven. It's a mandate, it's a doctrine, it is Sharia law. Do you remember what Sharia law is? Put your hand up. Okay, those who doesn't know what Sharia law is, put your hand up. <laughs> no 
Okay, Lord. <laughs> Sharia law is the constitution of Islam. Sharia law, law is made from two, two components. One of them is the Holy Quran, and the second one is the Hadith by Muhammad. The Hadith by Muhammad is the biography of Muhammad, the mandates of Muhammad, what Muhammad did. If he ordered to kill, then it's a mandate. If he ordered to do, uh, you know, uh, capturing, like for example, in one of his hadith, he said, I have been commanded to kill, uh, to fight and kill all people until they say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, until they say there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And if they refuse to do so, then their blood belong to me. So what does that mean? They must kill the man. The women belong to me. The children belong to me. The monies belong to me. The culture belong to me. Your land, your home, everything belong to me. So by Islamic right, when we come to the United States of America, it's a mandate because America is an infidel land. It's our right. Everything that you have belong to the Muslim. Everything. Ethnic cleansing is not done only by killing people. Ethnic cleansing is done by rape too, where you rape a nation and you fill it up with Islamic seeds and now Muslim boys and girls are all over the place. These are Islamic doctrines. So when we say Sharia law, Sharia law is made from several components. The highest component is the religious that derive everything. Right under it is the military, the right arm. And the second one is the civic, and then it goes to every level of a constitution. It's a government in the fullness of its power. So therefore, when it goes to your culture, it takes over your culture. Your culture becomes subdued, because why? Islam is made to take over. There is no mandate in Islam to, to share a country or a race or to live in harmony. They are mandated to take over until the death of the culture. You understand me? So Sharia law, this is what uh, Abdul Rauf Faisal, he's the Imam of Ground Zero Mosque. Ground Zero Mosque, what Americans don't understand, and I want you to pay very special attention in here. In Islam, when a the Muslim, they do ghazwa, which is raids, they send their armies, and now the army takes place. Now there are mandate, after they take a place, what they do is to build, build Rabat. Rabat is a place, it's like a fortress. The fortress is to bring more Islamic army, to bring more food, to bring more intelligence, to bring more and more and more, and bring about Sharia law to do the second invasion. So what they refer in the Muslim world at 9-11, it is Ghazwa, it's a raid. So now that the culture, the American culture, has been put to submission right there in New York, that place must be built according to Sharia law, where it's called Rabat. Now, that place will be an Islamic culture center. In Islam, there is no Islamic culture center, but it is to cultivate your culture from within. Do you understand me? Islam, when it goes to different places, it doesn't go to be equal to you in any way, form, or shape. Islam go to be a settler. They're pioneering. There's a movie I was debating whether I should show it or not. It's called Al-Muhajirun. Al-Muhajirun is a group of men that they left the Mideast and came to the United States of America. After 9-11, they stood in, in, uh, in New York City and they burned the American flag, they spat on the flag, they poured urine on the flag, and they start calling all other Muslims. They said, Muslim, we have four right to do this. Come and join us. The constitution of this country support us. Come be in our rank. And what did the Muslim people start joining their rank? And these guys were dressed in the military clothing. And I'm going like, what just happened? It's upside down. And I'm watching all this. But here's the scary part. They called Al-Muhajirun. It's very important to understand what Al-Muhajirun means. Muhammad, when he came to Mecca at the beginning, and he brought about Islamization, he modeled himself as a Christian. 
similar to Jesus Christ. It was peace. It was loving. It was kind. But all those 14 years when he was in Mecca, he got only 80 people, and he was getting beat up every day, and nobody wanted his religion. Because they said, your religion is just like ours. There's no different. Why should we join yours? So what happened is, when he ran away, and he went to Medina, what happened? Allah, the God of the Quran, he abrogated everything that he said before. And Allah said word for word, according to the Holy Quran, the generous Quran, he said, I have changed my mind. For I know what's better for my people. You have to trust me. I'm going, it sounds like sales pitch. The God of the Bible, if the Muslim said we worship the same God, this God says, I know the past from the future and future from the past. I wrote the story. I created you to worship me. I knew you by name. I created you for such purpose that this guy here is still finding his way. So what happened is, the difference between the two, it changed now, and now it was by the sword. The last two surah in the, uh, in the, in the Quran was for surah number 4, 5, and 9, which has abrogated everything that is peaceful. You know, so now, when it says no commotion in Islam, it doesn't apply anymore. Why? Because the new has replaced the old, and the old is out. In the restaurant business, they call it 86. In German, they call it kaput. In French, they call it fini. I don't know where I'm going with this. So what happened is, Al-Muhajirun, when they left from Mecca to Medina, the mandate was by the sword. So when they left their countries and came to America, that's mean they are the sleeping cells. That they are mandated to take the country by the sword. Are you listening to me? This is the truth, so help me God. So now, we're looking at the invasion is coming from within. Saudi Arabia pay the Muslim family, any Muslim family, to come to the United States of America, $100,000 to migrate here. $100,000. And when the, um, uh, the Muslim family moved to America, at the beginning, they don't wear Islamic clothes and what so have you until they situate themselves in different places. And when they do so, then they are paid $10,000 a month to wear Islamic clothes. So when you see those pictures in the verse of Ramadan, you have thousands of Muslim men and women shutting down New York from end to end. What does that mean? They bust them over there to make their presence known in your culture. They are paid to do so. Then, in France, when they bust them from all over, from Marseille, from Nice, from all those places and take them to Paris, and in Paris they start praying on the street and subdue the street by hundreds of thousands. What the Islamic are doing, it's a doctrine in Islam. You used to come to our country as tourists, but now get used to us because we're coming to take over your country. It is a full message. When the Muslims start writing in France, and we talk about the writing, for those who are not here, when the Muslims are at 2%, they're peaceful, they're loving, they're kind. Oh, God bless you. We worship the same God. Uh, let's eat hummus together. When they go to 6%, now they start causing issues. And they let their voice known all over the country, just like what's happening in the United States of America today. And when they reach 10%, they start riding and intimidating and taking over the country. That is a doctrine, and it's studied, and it's fulfilled in different countries. So now... When the Muslims were marching in France and rioting and burning everything, they burned 300 buildings. They built over 300 buildings, cars, automobiles. And when the reporter said, are you rioting here? They were declaring as they're marching, they said, we are, uh, this is our land. This is our land. This is our land. And the reporter said, are you declaring that this is your land because you're a citizen of this land? They said, no, because our ancestor never finished the conquest. The conquest that's mandated by Muhammad is to subdue the whole world. 
I want to go with you over the first jihad. The first jihad when Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, came about. He took over Mecca, Medina, all that area. He killed his family, the Quraysh tribes. He subdued the whole thing. He cleansed the earth over there from the Jews and the Christians, which is there were the popular leaders in that area at that time. And what happened after this, after he died? The Quran was not written until 60 years after he died. It was by Osman bin Affan, his third Khalifa. He came about and he wrote the Quran for the first time. And they don't know how where to put the dot, the T, the accent, the this and that. So it was written meaningless. And they don't know which surah came first, which surah came second, which is which book. So therefore they put it from number one, uh, from the smallest to the biggest. So it came just like, okay, this has two letters more, let's put it next. This has six letters more, let's put it next. So this is how they orchestrated. And it was 300 years after Muhammad died that the first time the Quran was written properly. Is the Quran corrupt? Muhammad they didn't know which surah it's true. But nevertheless, they know something that the second, the second jihad was, is they took over Europe, they went all the way to China, they went to Russia, they went many different places, Turkey, they subdued the whole world over there. The third jihad, America is the great Satan and the head of the serpent. And America must be captured. And the only way they have to do it, Imam Faisal, the Grand Zero Mosque, Imam says, they said, how can we subdue America? He said, you deal with her like you dating a beautiful woman. You just keep telling her she's beautiful until you subdue her. This is Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, the Ground Zero Mosque. Let's talk a little bit about Cordoba Initiative. Cordoba Initiative, many people, when you ask the Muslim or when you hear about our president, so our president celebrated Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, in the White House. After he has kicked National Day of Prayer out, after he told many of the pastors, I don't want to pray with you, he chose Ali Khan, and he prayed with Ali Khan five times a day, which is only the Muslim pray five times a day. And he said, I follow in my father's footsteps. So what happened is, he is declaring over America what's called the Dahamiya status. What is Dahami status? Anyone knows what Dahami status? Put your hand up. Keep it up. Dahami status. This is a doing church. This is a church that does the work of the kingdom. We have one. This is good. Many churches has none. So, the Hami status is what separates between Muslim and non-Muslim. So therefore, what happened, if I'm a Muslim and you are not Muslim, you are subservient to me. So if I'm walking on the street and you're walking in front of me and there's only one pass, you have to step out of my way. You could not wear, uh, ride a horse, you have to ride a donkey. Because only the Muslim ride a horse. If, a, if, an, up, uh, uh, if uh, an infidel and a Muslim go to court, automatically the infidel lose the case in the court. Immediately. It's a lost case, the Muslim win. If a Muslim kill non-Muslim, he goes free, all he has to do is pay what's called fidya, which is price for the personal life. But if non-Muslim kill a Muslim, then he's commended to death. In order, in order for you to live as a Dahami, you have to pay what's called penalty tax. That penalty tax, it's certain amount of money for your life. It's a ransom. And you have to pay it every month. Because if you don't pay it, then your life is acquired according to Sharia law. Obama is saying Sharia law is not bad. Sharia law is really good. America is applicable for Sharia law. Sharia law is nothing like the American institution. They are not the same. They are not even close to each other. Where are we going with this? Everybody remember what Article 6 is. Everybody say Article 6. Do you know what Article 6 is? Holy, holy. Article 6 is the heart of the Constitution because, Pastor, the Article 6, it is what separates religion from government. 
And if the Article 6 is revoked, what happened? The constitution of Islam, Sharia law, could be equal to the American government because it's not a religion, it's a government. So now because they live here, they will have the status to build their own centers. They have their own society, their own culture within our culture. So it will be like a cancer being in a human body trying to subdue the body. Does that make any sense? This is what you're dealing with. The Hami status is what Cordoba Initiative is all about. So when you have the health bill, it's been proved by our liberal and by the president, and they exempt the Muslim from it. What does it mean? The American people have to pay what's so called juzya in order to support whom? The Muslim. The Muslim are exempt from it, but you support them. So if they go to the hospital, your tax money will pay for them. Now, they are the elite and you are the subservient. When $60 million from your tax money or your tithes to this government, you know, you're going to pay tithes one way or another. To God or somebody else. I can go on this more. But nevertheless, $60 million is put for abortion. It is legal right for the Muslim to amend abortion in a non-Muslim culture. So when you start aborting and the government is paying you to abort your children, it is because your children are not Muslim. Do you understand me? Did I make it clear enough? So what happened here is, in a Muslim world, abortion is illegal. Why? Because they must bring as many children, it's mandated by Muhammad to subdue the world by numbers. So now, $60 million are put there to, to change your world, to put clinic on every corner, to abort, abort, abort. Then he turns to Kenya, which is his birthplace, and what does he do over there? He, did, he paid $23 million to advance, to advance abortion in Kenya. Why are you advancing abortion in Kenya? By American tax money. This is against our constitution because Kenya, only 10% of Kenya are Muslim. They are the Lu party. This is where his family is from and the rest are not. He's bringing abortion to non-Muslim countries. He's advocating this. So now when you have, you hear about Islamic mosque and you hear about Islamic centers. This is a good question that you, you know, everybody has to ask. What's the difference? The Muslim mosque is the parliament. When a Muslim mosque is open in an area, the area becomes a holy ground. It's 40 block radiant, it becomes holy. That's mean the whole Muslim world can come from every direction and inhabit this area and settle in this area. What they do, they start confirming the land, bringing the Sharia law food, halal meat, halal food, bring everything to the area. Muslims start moving in, people of the area start moving out because things are changing overnight. They force them in or out. How's that happening? It's happening all over Europe. All over Europe. And when that happened now, they start raising their sheriff according to this, the law of the country. They start raising their mayor. They start using their house reps. They start raising everything they want because it's their legal right because they're inhabiting the area. So the infiltration is taking place under your eyes and you could not do anything about it. After they inhabit the area, the area is besieged. You could not go to the area. Why? Because now they watch, they have their own guard, they have their own people, it's all over Europe. Many areas that no one can enter those areas, not even the European who, inherit the, uh, who, who owns the land, only the Muslim can enter those areas. And that area turned to sixth century culture overnight. Mr. Obama, it's okay to say you're a Muslim because the word says you know them by their fruit. There's two kind of people. 
those who are fruitful and those who are fruity. <laughs> and your fruitiness stinketh. It's out of the Bible. Where do I start? Where do I go from here? There are so many things that have taken place. If I tell you about Sharia law and what the Quran says, if I start with this, it will give you a headache. But it's not my job. It's your job to find out. It's time for American people to start reading the Quran, understanding what Islam is all about. Half of the battle is understanding what your enemies are up to. Half the battle for the American people to arise and make the difference. How much time do I have left? <laughs> to God be the glory.